I am a teacher. I teach little girls in preschool and kindergarten, and I teach grown-ups who are learning to become teachers. I am the mother of a daughter and a son. I have a doctorate in education, and I'm the director of a preschool and kindergarten building. I'm comfortable giving a lecture, but what I love most is talking with teachers about their work. It's taken me some time, but I've come to understand that I will learn the most when I say the least. A few years ago, I was enjoying lunch in our school dining room with a group of three to six-year-old girls when the lunch table ran out of milk. <laughs> One of the students volunteered to walk all the way across the dining room to the refrigerator to get a carton. Now, upon her return, she was asked by a peer, did you get cutified? <laughs> now, I can recall leaning back in my chair at this moment, kind of removing myself from the conversation. Those of you who have young children or work with them know that sometimes when they sense a grown-up is listening, the words change. A younger peer leaned in and said, well, what is cutified? Oh, you know, when an adult tells you just how cute you are, in that exact tone. <laughs> and no one was cutified on that day during that lunch period. But I was left reflecting deeply on the impact of that experience, thinking about how often we call young girls cute. Why is it our job to tell them a story about themselves first? And why do we not listen for them to tell us their story? I'm lucky. I work in a place where a story like this is taken very seriously. I work with people who help these girls understand that their words matter. It is written on our walls and we tell them all the time. Now, I also work in a place where I can walk down the hallway at any given time and hear a lot of exciting learning happening. And that's just what I did a couple years ago. I entered the three and four-year-old classroom because of the sounds I was hearing outside the door. Move out of the way! It's moving! You've got it going! Get over! These girls had gotten their caterpillar, a segmented caterpillar-like robot, to glide across, across their classroom. Lights flashing, music playing. The work around the caterpillar had been going on for a couple of weeks at this point. There had been successes, there had been frustrations. And when you're three, it can be hard enough to communicate to your peer with powerful words about what you want to do with this project. And these girls were disagreeing with one another in a civil way about which caterpillar piece should go in which order. And here they were, celebrating their success. I could not have walked into that classroom at a more powerful moment in their learning. These girls were at the brink of their zone of proximal development meaning that each of those girls as individuals had constructed knowledge in her mind about what she knew to be true about working with this robot. And together, in a social setting created by their teachers, they were able to bring that knowledge outside of their mind and co-construct new knowledge together. They were innovating. Now, this work was a victory for them and it was time for them to take their show on the road. So for the three and four year olds, what that looked like was walking across the grassy courtyard that leads to the big building where the older girls go to school. Now I would no sooner have found my three year old self racing down the hallway of a high school, but these girls ran ahead of their teachers to the upper school robotics lab. 
That is agency, and it gives them so much power. Now, the upper school robotics team, interestingly enough, had no knowledge of Fisher Price's Caterpillar. <laughs> this was okay, though, because our girls were bringing one with them, and they were prepared to share their process. It sounded something like this. You snap it apart, you snap it together. It has circles on top of it with arrows and symbols. We're telling the robot what to do. Have you heard of coding? <laughs> so this collaboration was sparked between the big girls and the little girls. And this collaboration lasted two years. This is possible because we are an all-girls school, preschool through 12th grade, and we're all here on this one campus. Jointly, the girls work together to create obstacle courses for the Coda Pillar. And one day in the gym, the courses were unveiled for everyone to see. Administrators, teachers, staff, anyone visiting the building that day was able to walk through and see the work and ask the questions. Now, developmentally, girls at this age are maturing at a very rapid rate in all domains, in their cognitive domain, in their physical domain, in their social emotional domain. Most markedly, their language is exploding and their identity formation is highly malleable, meaning that her 22-year-old self depends on the beliefs that she is forming right now as a four-year-old. And that four-year-old is going to be most capable in spaces where she can be pushed along her own individual developmental continuum. Now, in typical co-ed settings, a teacher can struggle to make time for slow social relational learning. It's almost impossible. We continue to see girls drawn to spaces of dramatic play and boys drawn to spaces of construction. It's not a bad thing that children act in this way in a co-ed setting, but it might be one of the reasons why we see low numbers of girls entering the STEM and computer science fields. And I see high numbers of girls entering teacher education, where I see them in my classroom. Now, as a university faculty member, I am constantly pressed to answer the question, why do I send my daughter to an all-girls school? And when my college-age students ask me, I give them a rightly valid and reliable answer. As an educational researcher, in this situation, boys are a confounding variable in the study of how girls learn. <laughs> And so, in our setting, boys are removed to make opportunities for girls to fill all the roles. I see all girl in early childhood as an early intervention for life. One that empowers her concept of self and propels her capacity to succeed no matter where she goes after that. At this critical time in her development, when she is forming an identity that will shield her against society's negative stereotypes that tell her what she can and cannot be and what she will and will not do when she grows up, we are all called to create spaces where girls do all the hard things, fill all the roles, and where their ideas and voices are valued before their cuteness.